Hi, I'm Wes Allen with DM Tales, and today I'm taking a look at Troll Lord Games, Castles and Crusades. Let's roll it. I need to give a shout out to my sponsor, Daddy Rolled One, who created this wonderful t shirt featuring a D20 fighting off some vicious dice goblins. Daddy Rolled One is a fantastic follow on Twitter. He also blogs about his experiences in running various role playing games. But more importantly, he has a web store. And if you go to his store, you can find designs like this one, including many others for t shirts and other merchandise. And if you use the code DMTALES, that's right, I'm a discount code now, so yay me, you'll get 15% off your purchase. So go visit Daddy Rolled A One's web store and let him know DM Tales sent you. It's great for my channel and it's a wonderful opportunity for you to support a small creator doing some really cool stuff. Let's get to the review. Castles and Crusades is named after the wargaming group that Gary Gygax was part of when D&D was originally getting formed. So it has nothing to do with the Crusades, which is a terrible bit of history that really shouldn't be celebrated nor role played. So we're just going to get that out of the way. The game is interesting in that it has printings instead of editions. So if you have a first or second printing of the game, you can play with people who are using the current printings of the game because the base mechanics of the system have not changed since its inception around 2004. This is a cool feature, but it can also be a tad difficult for newcomers because the printings of the books don't line up. Currently, the Player's Handbook is in its eighth printing, while the Castle Keeper's Guide the Castle Keeper is what Castles and Crusades calls the GM or the Dungeon Master. That's in its third printing. And then Monsters and Treasures, which is the equivalent basically of the Monster Manual, that's in its fifth printing. So it gets a little confusing as to which one is which. Whereas if you were doing editions, you could say, okay, we're at the third edition. This is the standard that we're using. And it's just a little bit easier to jump in. As you might have picked up, the game spans three books, pretty much as it has since the original Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, and even the booklets back in original D&D. Most of what players need, and really most of what a castle keeper needs, can be found in the player's handbook, so that's really the most essential of the books to own. The Castle Keeper's Guide is mostly optional. It does have some good alternate rules, particularly with the way it handles magic. It shifts to a mana point system rather than the Vancean fire and forget system that has been part of D&D since its inception. It also has different ways to handle rolling up your ability scores and some other optional rules that are in there. It's good stuff, but mostly it's things you can find in any old edition of D&D, so it's not essential the way that the player's handbook is essential. Where the Castle Keeper's Guide does shine is with its world building examples. And really, if you want to play a game, any game, Castle Keeper's Guide is a good way of thinking about how to populate your world. It goes into different settlement types and how to stock them. And it even goes into the way that cave systems are formed, which is something that can be a real help to creating a cave-based dungeon crawl. So yeah, essential, no, but if you're building your own world, this is probably a good help. The current printings of Castles and Crusade also have alternative tribute covers, which pay homage to the original Trampier covers for Advanced Dungeons and & Dragons, and these are gorgeous. All of Troll Lord Games stuff is stitched binding. It's not going to fall apart like a glued binding book. It should last a good long time. I'm going to save my comments on Monsters and Treasures to a little bit later. For now, let's look at the game basics. Now, the attribute scores for Castles and Crusades are the same as Dungeons and Dragons. The ability scores are Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma. And as it has been with every Dungeons and Dragons editions and all of the retro clones that are built off of it, well, mostly all of them, your scores range from 3 to 18. The rules as written are to roll 3d6 and add that number up, although in Castles and Crusades, you are allowed to assign your scores to whatever attribute you want. So there's a little bit more wiggle room in the way the rules are written than in, say, Moldvay Basic or AD&D. 
The modifiers also align well with basic D&D rather than with the advanced counterpart. Uh, 9 to 12 is an average score. 13 to 15 gives you a plus 1. 16 to 17 is a plus 2. And an 18 is a plus 3. The lower scores on the spectrum follow the same essential pattern. Castles and Crusades is made possible by the OGL, so it very much borrows some elements from 3rd edition D&D. And one of the ways it does that is in combat because it uses an ascending armor class system. Higher number is better. This is straightforward and simple. It is one of the great advancements that 3rd edition brought to the game, and it's something that I do look for in my retro clones at this point because it just makes more sense. And yes, I grew up with combat matrices, and I did Thacko, and I understand how all of that works. I just think Ascending Armor class works better, because you're rolling a 20-sided die, you might as well make the AC the number you need to beat. There are 13 character classes in the game, and they are a nice mix of martial, casters, and specialist classes. Experience tables in the eighth printing of the player's handbook are split into two. The first table goes up to level 12, which is where earlier printings of the game stopped. The eighth printing of the player's handbook has high level play and goes from level 13 all the way up to 24. Each class gets its own advancement charts in Castles and Crusades, so it's an older style of play like that. A thief is going to advance faster than a magic user or an illusionist, for example. And I kind of like having the different classes have their own advancement because it, it helps to level the playing field a little bit for a lot longer. A sixth level magic user with incredible spells is suddenly going to be much more powerful than a thief at sixth level uh, the way that old school is played. And so it's something that I appreciate. Also, I'm old school and I like yelling at clouds. And I really want to see how these different character classes play out at the table. They have their own vision for how the different classes work. Uh, casters are not every class. Paladins can't cast spells, nor can rangers in this game. And they really buff up illusion magic because the makers of Castles and Crusades really seem to have felt that illusionists were always getting short shift. And so illusionists are cool in this game. And in fact, one of my players is playing an illusionist just because they wrote up the illusion magic so well in the player's handbook. So kudos to that. Castles and Crusades has good rules for multi-classing, but it also has something called a class and a half, which gives you a way to essentially homebrew your own class. There's some basic guidelines for which types of classes you can mix and the impact that your character's equipment and ability scores and things like that are going to have on which abilities you can use from that half class. And instead of advancing as a dual class where you have to have the amount of experience points equal to the next level for both classes, in a class and a half system, you advance as a single number, which is equal to the full experience point value for your base class and then half of the experience point value for your secondary class. When you hit that number, you go up a level. It takes away some of the headaches of multi-classing. And like I said, it gives you an ability to almost roll your own class if you want give it some nice buff abilities with just the penalty of advancing a little less fast. Castles and Crusades uses the token idea of race. This is something that a lot of modern games are getting away from and instead are taking that unified concept of race and splitting it between species and culture to give a little bit more variation in the non-human species that you are able to play. This is not something that I see Troll Lord games ending anytime soon. They're probably going to stick with the Tolkien-esque race because they're going for that older style of play. That might be something you care about. It might be something that you don't care about. It might be something that you're angry that I'm even bringing up. And if you're in that camp, please go take a nap or something because you're just too angry for words right now. But it's where... CNC is. In the base game, there are seven races that you can play. This includes the humans and the elves and the dwarves and the halflings that you would expect from original D&D, but it includes some others as well. My favorite by far is Castles and Crusades take on gnomes. I love how they're not just smaller halflings or slightly different dwarves. They are their own species and culture. They have a lot more attunement with elves than anything. And I think that's really cool. I'm kind of disappointed that my in-person table, which I'm about to start running, no one wanted to be a gnome because I just like them so much and I'm gonna have to start throwing gnomish NPCs at them really fast. 
Now, Castles and Crusades tries to go with an older mentality and make humans the most preferable race to play. One of the ways they do this I'm going to talk about in a little bit, but the first way they really get you to rethink playing a non-human species is by taking away dark vision. Elves and halflings, they can't see in the dark in this game the way they could in earlier editions. They have what's called twilight vision. So if they have starlight or moonlight, they can see really well, almost as if it was daylight. You take them down into a dungeon where there is no light at all, and they are as unable to see as a human. So they're going to need torches. I love this. Dwarves still have their dark vision because in the world of castles and crusades, they are a people who are used to living underground. Uh, gnomes, I also think, have it. I'll go back and check on that. But uh, elves and halflings, nope. Half-elves, nope. Twilight vision, that's all they get. Where the game really stands out is with its engine, which they call the siege engine. As you would expect, because it is an OGL compliant game, it is a D20 system, but there are some changes. Every one of the skills that a character tries to use inside the game is now an ability check or an attribute check, but they throw their own wrinkle into it because the way that these checks are calculated is dependent upon something they call the challenge base. That is dependent upon your primary attributes. Because if you are doing an attribute check and it's a primary attribute, your base is 12. If you are doing an attribute check for something that is not a primary attribute, your base is 18. And here's where humans take a step ahead of most non-humans in the game. Because humans get three primary attributes. So three out of their six can be primary, while non-humans, who get all their abilities for being non-human, they only get two. Each class has an assigned primary attribute. So humans get to choose two more, non-humans get to choose one. That's a really nice split. And in fact, the majority of my players at my Castles and Crusades table looked at that and went, I'm playing a human. They wanted to give humans a buff without giving them extra abilities. The way the final number determine that you need to roll over for any type of attribute check in the game is by taking your challenge base and then adding a challenge class to it. This can be arbitrarily assigned by the GM or the castle keeper. Say a thief is listening at a door or trying to pick a lock. You can determine how difficult that lock is by assigning a challenge class. Or if you are doing something against an NPC who has a level or a creature with a number of hit dice, the challenge class becomes either the character level or the hit dice of the creature. So if you're trying to do something to a 6 HD creature using an attribute that is not primary, you're gonna end up with a challenge level of 24, which is gonna be kind of difficult to hit with a D20. Likewise, if you are doing a check with something that is based off of a primary attribute with a base of 12, six HD creature, your base is 18. Still not great to hit, but at least you have more of a chance. So if you're trying to do something which has a challenge base of 18, how are you ever going to hit that? Because everything's going to have a challenge class that goes above 20. And this is the way that Castles and Crusades handles the roles. If you're trying to do a task and it's not a skill that overlaps with another class, when you roll, you can add your character level to the role. And in addition to that, you get to add whatever modifier to your ability score that you have. So say you are a sixth level rogue and you're trying to persuade someone of something, just trying to pull the wool over their eyes. You don't really have a high charisma, but it's okay, it's 15, but it's not a primary attribute. Your base is 18. You're trying to persuade someone who is like a second level fighter, let's say, which means the challenge class is two and the challenge level is 20. When you roll, you'll be able to add your six because that's your character level to your roll and whatever charisma attribute modifier you have. So that's another one. So you're rolling a seven. So suddenly now you only need to roll a 13 or up and your chances get much better to accomplish this task. I like the way that this grows with the characters as they go up in level. 
that skills that they might not have had developed earlier on because they just don't have the primary attribute for that, at later levels, they're going to be able to actually attempt and even succeed in. Unless it is a trait or an ability that's attached to another character class, like picking a lock. In that case, a person who is not that class, when they roll, they don't get to add their character level to it. They're just using their modifier. It still becomes much more difficult. I'm fascinated by this system, and I really am looking forward to seeing it in practice because it feels like it would work really fast, and I'm dying to see if it does. So the siege engine is the selling point for the entire system over everything. That is really the cool part. And in a way, it overcomes some of the quirks of the system. One of the side effects of it having printings, not editions, the different books don't track with the same layout. The way things altered from first edition AD&D to second edition AD&D, the design language for all the core books was changed together. You don't have that in Castles and Crusades. And this makes things a little bit confusing. The current printings of the Player's Handbook and the Castle Keeper's Guide use an updated design language that moves away from the fake parchment page that earlier printings had. There's a nice little gray texture in place of that faux parchment background, and that makes the text easier to read. There's also some updated artwork, which tends to get away from the watercolor effects that some of the earlier printings had. It adds some different depictions of the character classes than what you had in earlier printings as well. All in all, the new design language is spectacular. I love it, and I think it's fantastic. However, the current printing of the Monsters and Treasures book, even though it has the same style tribute cover as the other two books in the series, it uses the older design language. And the detail for the layout of the Monsters and Treasures book is odd as well. The creatures aren't in any kind of standard place, and sometimes they're not even on the same page as the main entry for the creature as described. There's not a whole lot of rhyme or reason to where creature stat blocks can start on a page, and so some start way down on a page and then there might be one or two items for the stats before it jumps to the other column, which makes sense from a just flowing from one page to the next if it was a word processing document, but for a book, it makes it much more difficult to read. And then the creature descriptions really feel like they're coming from different voices. Some people phrase something one way, and other people phrase it another way, and oftentimes there doesn't seem to be a unified way of how to present these creatures to the person who is reading the book. So of the three, The Monsters and Treasures is definitely the second most necessary book to have for the game because it shows you the power levels of the creature, specifically for Castles and Crusades, but it was the least enjoyable to read just because of those design quirks. I've reached out to Trollord Games. I know that they are planning on updating Monsters and Treasures with the newer design language. I hope it happens soon. And I hope there's a great deal of attention paid to editing, to not just get the look of it okay, but to get the layout and flow of the book also making the most sense for the content and not just to fit it in a certain number of pages. If you would like to purchase Castles and Crusades for yourself, the books are available at trolllord.com. They're also available at Amazon, but it's nice to pay direct because you get the creators all the money instead of giving Amazon a cut. Uh, or you can just go to your friendly local gaming store and have them order it for you. If you would like to get the Player's Handbook, the current printing is listed at $39.99. The Monsters and Treasures book is $49.99. And the Castle Keeper's Guide, which is the largest of the three, is also listed at $49.99. If you are just looking for the PDFs, you can get them at DriveThruRPG. They are $19.99 a piece. If you would like a combo package and get the print and the PDF, you can order that through Trollord Games. That adds $20 to the price of each of the books. So it's basically the same as buying them separate. However, if you really want to check out the game and you're not willing to put down some money at the time, you can get the seventh printing of the player's handbook from Trollord Games for free. Download the PDF, check out the game, and see if it's something that interests you. That's a great feature that Trollord Games does, and I think it's something that a lot of people should take advantage of. So what are my final thoughts? Well, despite the design quirks, and I think there's some things that really could be improved just from an editing standpoint, this is a very good game. The Siege Engine is cool. I am looking forward to seeing it in action. There's some nice tweaks or some nice differences that make it not just another D&D clone. It's really a game that I think 
that people might enjoy playing. And in fact, the Siege Engine fascinates me so much that it's jumped ahead of some other games that I had planned on playing before it, like Old School Essentials. I just want to see this take on an advanced Dungeons & Dragons idea from the D20 era. I am going to be playing a live table of this, like in-person table of it next week. And I think that's going to be my video next week. I'm gonna introduce you to my players and maybe show you a couple snippets from the game. I have some new people at the table and I've never run an in-person game before, at least not as an adult. So this is gonna be a lot of fun for me. So until we see each other again, happy playing everyone. <laughs>